All right, good morning. Everybody had all their coffee, they're wide awake. Uh, I know I have to have two cups myself to get going. So uh, thanks for everybody coming up and uh, listening in. And we got some interesting things to talk about. I think it's a, a in my mind, I think it's a great, this whole conference is a great way to, you know, instill that uh, compassion between all of us of how to, how to help our country, how to help the energy efficiency, but really how to help ourselves and our companies. And uh, there's a lot of opportunities out there. Um, they're just becoming more and more, especially we all know about existing buildings. And so today we're going to talk about you know, decarbonization. So uh, this is essentially the CX and the energy professionals. Uh, it's a funding opportunity. You know, we all know about the, uh, uh, the government uh, passed the Inflation Reduction Act, and there's put a lot of criteria in there about uh, uh, green energy and, and climate uh, climate change and all that. So we're going to talk about that. And essentially, we're rolling this into a, a – uh, we're talking about climate change and decarbonization. A lot of people don't really know what decarbonization is. We're going to talk about that. And really, this is – we're focusing on – this is the CX project you're working on. So you can apply this to any job. And, uh, you know, we have a lot of projects here that are retro commissioning. Retro commissioning, you know, energy savings and uh, quick paybacks and things like that. But you want to roll it into climate change. And a lot of the big corporations now all have policies. And uh, there's been some topics around. They, they talk about um, the, there's three three parts of uh, decarbonization. So uh, Carl's going to go through that and describe that. Uh, my name's Tim Gilbert. Uh, we're both with Saul Sobron. Uh, Carl's a founding member of uh, Saul Sobron in 1975. And I've uh, been in the business for for uh, 44 years, a mechanical engineer. Um, ju as of yesterday, I just uh, moved up to the uh, president of the Energy Management Association. So I've been on the board a couple of years. Before that, I was on the uh, BCA Southeast chapter uh, board of directors for six years and served two years as president. So, uh, but I've always been in involved in the uh, construction business. So. Um, we're really excited about being here. Done a lot of commissioning work uh, for many, many years. Before that, I did a lot of design work. Um, Carl, again, uh, one, one great thing about Carl, Carl's been in, uh, in the uh, Association of Energy Engineers for a long, long time, and he is a past president. And uh, Carl does a lot of uh, talks around the country, uh, well-versed in uh, all the uh, energy-related type topics. So we're going to go over our objectives today. You know, basically want to understand the carbon converse, conversation, you know, what, what is it between CX and energy? How, do, how we can we focus those two things together and get that business going? We want to talk about definitions and metrics. You know, everybody talks about uh, climate change, you know, CO2, metric tons, et cetera. We're going to go over that, talk about what those other greenhouse gases b besides carbon. And we're going to talk about the Inflation Reduction Act. You know, the government's got money out there. Uh, this is a lot of federal buildings. There are mandates about how they're going to have to change these federal buildings and, and get down and reduce the carbon content and carbon impact. And they want to make sure there's a clear understanding of how the CX people can have those opportunities and understand how to translate those into sales for your, your companies and then execute these projects as we go through those, those type of jobs. And we'll start this off with a case study. I uh, did a project back, uh, it was uh, 20, start 29 to 2012, and uh, this case study was a, a laboratory in Atlanta, and it was a 24-7 facility. It's a state of Georgia facility, so it runs all the time. Uh, they even, these guys and ladies work on the weekends a lot. Um, it's a two-story building, 67,000 square feet. It was built in 1995. And uh, there's a, so the good thing about this particular project, you know, we think about retro commissioning, you, you normally want to have a three-year payback. You, it's hard to get a client to do anything if you can't get a, a three-year payback. So uh, you always look for the low-hanging fruit, as they call it. But in this particular case, there was a lot of the energy projects going on by the federal government. So there was extra funding for this project, and that funding was both federal and state. So the great thing about that, they allowed us to increase our payback time up to 10 years. The, the rule was you had to show a payback within 10 years, which is not common in retro commissioning. So we, we had the benefit of doing that. We came up with 10 ECMs, seven of which were uh, implemented. Uh, and we actually worked in that, we're actually still working in that, that project right now. They're getting ready to do an expansion. So um, this particular, some of the key things in this 
And you can see the picture is old, old chiller R22 um, machine is actually leaking. So uh, ultimately in phase two, we replaced that. Uh, the, the, we had a huge boiler. These were Hearst boilers. These, there were two of these things. And um, the interesting thing about this job too is they had a maintenance contract. The contractor would come in every Monday morning and go to the two boilers and hit the start button. So it's got controls. Use the controls, you know. So it was, it was uh, very interesting, and they didn't really have anybody running the bill. No, really knew anything about facilities. So that was that was a first thing that was really bad. But some of the ECMs that we came up with really um, were, were pretty so so straightforward. The control system was an old JCI uh, system, and they uh, upgraded that to the Bluetooth. At the time, that was the new stuff in uh, 2010, 2011. So uh, the system really didn't really work right. So part of that was getting rid of the controls. We uh, rebalanced the whole system. Uh, we, then we commissioned after that. But one of the big things that, where we saved a huge amount the code in 1995 when this thing was built for our lab said that your ventilation rate, which is one in, one out, is 20 air changes an hour. Well, in the time of the code had been changed to, to 12 air changes an hour. And I believe that's still the code requirement today, 12 air changes an hour. So that's a big impact. That's almost half. You can cut your outside air back for 100% outside our system. That's huge savings to right off the bat. So not only did we do that, we went through the, all the labs and we took out the cubic feet of all the furniture, the cabinets, the freezers, all that because they're occupying space. You don't, that's not part of your calculation. It's not just a simple box. You can take all that out. So we reduced it even more. So that, number one, that was the number one energy saver. And that was just really rebalancing the system. Uh, it, the fan, big air handler, served an entire building it was very poor duct connection off the unit. Uh, off the front of the unit, it had a hard 90 oval right off the top of the big plenum box. Luckily, it had about 15 feet to the mechanic room wall, so we basically reworked the duct work. And came off the front and did 245s up. That one change right there saved an inch and a half of static. Inch and a half of static. They were running this thing at five and a half inches. I dropped it down to three and a half, and we, they had smoke dampers in the discharge for the two supplies. Well, smoke dampers were a code requirement back then. You had to be able to isolate that. But of course, we had a smoke, smoke detector, so you didn't have to worry about that. So we got rid of the smoke dampers. That knocked another half inch off the static. The two inline uh, vein axial fans, the, everybody remembers the old Joy fans, the, the had blades on it that modulated. Well, they were stuck frozen. It wouldn't move. The actuators were crapped out. And they were stuck at different positions. So the fans were up in a very poor position on the fan curve. So we jerked those out, replaced the motors, which was about 85%, put in 93% motors. That one change in the motor saved, I think it was $150 a day just changing the motors out. Then you're fixing the dampers and all that. I think we end up getting up to about $350 a day of savings just on those few things there. So that was a huge savings. Um, other things that we did too uh, was essentially um, the air handling unit coil had some issues. It had some deterioration. It was actually about to collapse and fall through the floor just about. It was, they really hadn't maintained this. So we had issues with that. We replaced the air handling coil. Chill water valve was messed up. It was bypassing most of the water. So, you know, obviously you can't get the coolant effect if you're bypassing the water around the coil. The humidifier inside the unit was a steam humidifier. The steam, steam humidifier controls were messed up. So that was a problem. So we summarized all that, went back through, did everything, uh, went through with that with the contractor. And you can see the savings here. Um, it, it cost a little over 700000 We saved almost 900000 KWH. And uh, the problem with the boilers, you only needed one boiler and they were running both boilers because this is a lab, so you've got redundancy and they were running both these huge boilers. Steam traps were another thing. We must have replaced eight steam traps that were just leaking like sieves. So there was wasting gas, wasting water. Wa I was just, it, this building was probably one of the largest energy hogs in the state of Georgia system. It was pushing eight bucks a square foot. That's just shock, you know, most, and so when we finished, we were down to a little over $2 a square foot. So we, uh, we made a big impact on the, the which saved me as a, a Georgia citizen taxpayer money from all that energy hog that they had over there. So that, um, that was the whole purpose of that. Then we knew that they had problems with the chillers, but they couldn't do it in this first phase. 
later, it was about a year later, we replaced one chiller, and it was a big savings there. It was, um, you know, it cost again in a tight mechanical room, getting it in and getting it out, we ran the cost up, but we did save a lot more KW. Of course, no natural gas was impacted there, but uh, we ended up with uh, 150,000 bucks saved on each set. So it was a tremendous impact on that. And one interesting thing about this particular lab, Every child born in Georgia, their, their blood work goes to this lab and they test that blood for disease or whatever. So, um, and they also had a, a BSL-4 section. It's any substance found in the state of Georgia that was suspect, the uh, lab director lady had to keep her cell phone on all the time. She'd get a call from the state patrol at three o'clock in the morning. They'd bring a package over. She had to meet them at the lab and they took that into the BSL-4 tested to find out what it was. Was it something poisonous, what, you know, all that. So this lab was a critical lab for the, for the state, uh, still is today. Uh, so the next slide. That's me. And I believe this is Mr. Mr. Carl. <laughs> He's gonna take it over from here. And we're gonna circle back on this case study. So we're doing this, this uh, we just did the project. Essentially, you know, these projects are very similar to high level people. Uh, controls change, verbal frequency drives, the boiler was turned on, all that stuff is the same. And so I'm with all the facilities guys, and the very back is a guy, the provost, and he was <laughs> digital controls, new sequences. Can you believe I leave the boiler on? And I said, and by the way, this is gonna save about, about 4,000 metric tons of greenhouse gas. And the freaking provost back there goes, oh my gosh, oh, I didn't know that, tell me more. And that's what we want to leave you with today. We want to leave you with, I don't care if you believe in climate change, it doesn't matter, but we want to leave you with a sense that if you just change a little bit or add a little bit to your pitch, three year payback, uh, yeah, that's not, well, oh, but I want to save 2,000 metric tons of greenhouse gas, great. Now, why do you care? Let's say you don't even agree with climate change. So what I do, what I did, Tim, I guess he called me about eight months ago and said we ought, to, we ought to do this thing. And so about a week ago, I got on the web and I said, what are the biggest employers in Dallas and in Fort Worth? And you know, a bunch popped up. But these are with employers of more than, I think, 7,000 employees. So this is Dallas, CBRE. You get on the website, they have at least three different web pages about sustainability and their commitment. They're going to reduce scope one, scope two, and scope three. They want to be industry leading in emissions reductions. AT&T, active towards carbon neutrality, scope one and scope two. Now we move to Fort Worth, Lockheed Martin, 70% reduction, 100% offsets, scope one, scope two and reduce scope two emissions American with more than 90% reduce our carbon footprint. Yeah, Carl, but that's not anything about CX, right? It has nothing to do with commissioning, does it? You don't have to write this down yet, I'm telling you. You guys are gonna be experts in about 15 minutes because you're doing more than most of the solar systems going in in the state or the locality you're working in. So, let me show you why you're gonna be experts. Uh, you had to be able to calculate or at least understand your carbon footprint and the emissions inventory. And to do that, there's something called the World's Resources Institute. They have defined what it is that all these corporations are saying, okay, we're going to commit to 30% reduction in our baseline by 2030. Okay, a lot of them are saying that 2035, 2040. So all you have to do is there's uh, six compounds. Up at the top, you have to be worried about, there's scope one, scope two, scope three, there's about, a, about 10 variables. And you're probably going, how are you gonna make me an expert in 10 minutes? Stand by, because I'm gonna demystify this in a few minutes. So, uh, and, and let me tell you, something else that's been going on, let me see what I got next. Oh yeah, uh, every carbon uh, monitoring project is, uh, I put boring in there because, so, you know, I'm pretty far on in my profession now. 
So I get, and I, I get to go to a lot of these fundraisers, you know, at the art museum or, you know, for YMCA, their annual gala, that sort of thing. And when, I'm, when I go to these spaces, you know, I'm, I'm an engineer, so I'm a pretty good observer. And I see, like, somebody goes up to, you know, you meet a lot of people you don't know. They don't have name tags at these high-end things, which, thank goodness, we have name tags. But uh, so I see somebody go up to, like, a, a doctor, and they say, oh, hi, my name's Carl. What's your name? Oh, I'm Joe. You're a doctor? Oh. I, my, my daughter's going to med school. I really want to ask you some things. So then I see somebody go up to like a, a lawyer. Well, you're a lawyer? Oh, my name's Carl. I'm, but no, somebody else goes up and he says, oh, my name's Joe. Uh, oh, you're an, you're an attorney? Oh, tell me this, that, and the other thing. Tell me about, uh, I've got a lease issue. Then you go up to the accountant even, and I see somebody go up to an accountant, and the accountant goes, and the guy says, oh, you're an accountant? Wow, tell me, I got some tax issues. Can you just give me an opinion? So then they come up to me and I go, hi, my name's Carl. We do MEP and commit. And they just walk completely away. They completely walk away. It's a, I even got a suit on it, doesn't matter. So that's why I, I like to start by saying every project affects, every project you're doing, more than solar systems affects it. And you don't know it. And a lot of people don't know it. And that's why I say boring. And by the end, it's not going to be so boring. So let me show you what I first, my first realization. You guys will get this. And uh, you know, we were doing, we do a lot of facilities work, replacing a cooling tower. Cooling tower is 35 years old. It should have been replaced at 25 years. So we're replacing it. We have a construction budget that maybe 200,000 or something. And you know, we're pretty good engineers like you guys. You guys get it. And by the way, when I say guys, I mean guys and gals. Thank you. <laughs> I guess I mean guy, guy. Oh, no. There we go. OK, so, uh, so uh, the, the thing was pumped so goofy. It was just the tower, just in and out. Just give us the design docs, make sure it meets code. But it was piped so goofy that we realized that if we repiped the thing, we could reduce the pump horsepower from 40 to 20. I don't think Tim's project had one of those. And so we, we went to the people and said, you know, it's going to cost about 50 grand but we can reduce the, uh, the horsepower by half. And here's the savings guys and gals. And guess what the facilities guys said? No, scope creep. What are you talking about? Budget overrun, scope creep, we can't do that. Now you guys and gals know this is a 30 year project, right? It's a 30 year project. Once you do this, nobody's gonna look at it for 30 years. We're just, oh, we can't sleep at night, come on. At the same time, in the same city, they did another project that had 24,000. It saved about one quarter of that. It cost twice as much. And guess what? The mayor showed up. The city council showed up. It was in the papers. And of course, I'm going, <laughs> what's wrong with me? So you might say, well, yeah, it saved a lot of carbon. Well, it did. It saved 10 tons of carbon, 10 metric tons. Pretty good, huh? The cooling tower project saved three times amount of carbon. And again, what I, that's, why I want, that's why I'm here today, just to remind you what the value that we're all making with every one of our customers. But you forget that way up here, they don't know. You're talking kilowatt hours, which you should. You're talking dollar savings. They like that, but they've made a commitment to reduce their carbon footprint. So let's go on. So I, I want to calibrate you first. I bet none of, I bet every one of you know how many miles per gallon your car gets. Right? You know roughly how many miles per... What's your carbon footprint? What's the per capita carbon footprint? I have no idea. It's so easy. Uh, it's, it's 14. It's 14 metric tons per year, each one of us. About 14 metric tons per year. And that's no big deal, but when you're talking to somebody and they think, and they, 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 they're interested in climate, you, talk, you know your miles per gallon, but just remember, you're about 14 metric tons per year, each one of us, per capita. And in fact, if you go around the world, and that's, you know, there's a lot of people going around the world. And this is the, uh, I guess this is 2021, but this is a carbon footprint of, uh, I've updated the 14.24, but the others are 2021. And you can see over the world, no surprises, you know, after the third world countries have much lower carbon footprints. Uh, the Europe has a, uh, significantly lower than us. China is very low, but you should see the growth curves of China on their carbon footprint. It's going like this. Everybody else, the U.S. is going like this. Europe is kind of going like this. And uh, so uh, you can kind of get a sense. But that gives you a sense of things. And it's OK, so when you get home tonight, you're going to say to your, your wife or husband or partner, uh, so I learned my carbon footprint. You know, we're about 14 metric tons. 
just like my car gets, my Prius gets 45 miles a gallon or my Land Rover gets 20 miles a gallon. So, you know, it's just, just conversational. Now you're calibrated. So, uh, what are the basics? I'm going to take you back to that World Resource Institute and show you there are six compounds. There's scope one, scope and two, and scope three. And then you've got a customer, and he's, you're saying, oh, I'm going to help you with your carbon footprint, too, with this uh, commissioning project I'm doing. And uh, so how do, you, how do you do that? Well, what's so interesting is scope three is business travel, waste disposal, outsourced activities, uh, all kinds of things like that. It's like, wait a minute, how am I going to do that? that? That has nothing to do with commissioning, does it? Not really. I'm going to show you what does a little bit. But the interesting thing is AT&T is going to hit 30% uh, reduction in carbon footprint by 2035. That's only scope one and scope two. What you're going to see is all the baselines you're here. We're going to hit our baseline of 18, 1994 by 2050. It's all scope one and scope two. So let me show you scope one and scope two. First of all, there's only one compound. It's just CO2. That's CO2. You've been living with that your whole life, right? That's all it is. It's not six compounds. It's one. Secondly, let's look at Scope two first. Scope two is purchased electricity. It's your customer's electric bill. How many times have you looked at that when you're doing a commissioning project? Every time, right? What's scope two? Scope two is called direct. It's fuel combustion. It's your customer's gas bill. Have you ever done that before? Have you ever looked at a gas bill, electric bill, Tim, on your case study? Kilowatt hours and therms, right? That's what it is. Now, I do want to add that scope two is direct. It means the fossil fuels. That's what decarbonization. They want us to get rid of scope two, decarbonization. They get rid of fossil fuels. So um, <clears throat> it's also your company-owned vehicles. And the way to boil this down very simply is to uh, take it to your home. If you wanted to calculate your 14 metric tons carbon footprint, Scope one is your gas bill, your natural gas bill. If some of you use propane, natural gas. Scope two is your electric bill. That's all it is. Now, also scope two is, uh, oopsie, also scope two is uh, gasoline and diesel. So, you know, you, you drive whatever car you drive, how many gallons a year to use, electric bill, gas bill, your, your car bill, um, your gas bill, I mean your, um, your automobile bill. And what's cool about this is, I'm going to challenge you. They made me give, they made us, Tim and I do a 10 question list. Go home and calculate your carbon footprint. Get your electric bill for the year, your gas bill for the year, and guesstimate your gasoline. I drive a Prius. I get about 45 miles an a gallon. I, I run about uh, 15,000 miles a year. So, you know, you can figure that out pretty quickly how many gallons you use. Anyway, what's so interesting is that it's the exact same thing if you're in a commercial facility, just like your house. Now, again, they have diesel generators, so you, you have to look at the, the diesel. But uh, some of you are probably, uh, probably uh, commissioning those, too. Um, and the same for industry, the heaviest industry. You know, we work for Procter & Gamble. It's the same calculation, just like you do at home. And I, I, I do want to tell you that about five years ago, my wife and I cut, you know, we're aware of things. We cut our carbon footprint in half. In fact, it was about 55%. What happened is we got our two adult kids to move out of the house. And I, you can't imagine, you can't imagine how well that worked. It's kind of like turning that boiler off, yeah. you know? <laughs> Subtle difference, but, but not much. Anyway, so that's, that's the thing. It's, that's all it is. I mean, it's, it, uh, it'll be the simplest thing you do. And we're going to show you that in the final case study. So uh, that's the thing, though. And, you won't be surprised. You ever say to yourself, oh, geez, it's all that funny money up there. They, they won't give us a three-year payback, but they put in, uh, they have gold trim on the carpet. How do they justify that? And so there is, I'm going to call it gaming, but this is more trying to get you guys and gals calibrated a little bit here. Um, so you know you're about 14 metric tons per capita. What I'm going to show you is there are lots of variations. So I, I, and there, I would might suggest there's a little bit of gaming, too. 
For engineers, so we don't typically game, maybe as much as accountants or even attorneys or who, you know, I hope there aren't any in the room or too many. Uh, so this is uh, our states. If you look at by state, what the carbon footprint is, you know, we're at, it's supposed to be around 14 metric tons average, but you can see we vary by state from a low of about eight or nine to up to uh, about, what is that, 100 metric tons by state. So you can see Texas is here at 21.4, California is here at 9.1. And uh, what's so interesting is so, you know, I love doing this. And when, I, when I'm going to be at some place, I will say, well, let me see what's going on. So I got on the Austin website. And of course, they have a whole sustainability page. I didn't see a commissioning page, but they have a whole sustainability page. And uh, here's what it says in the Austin. This is just about two weeks ago. Austin is 8.5 metric tons. So they're better than California. Now, all the guys I know in California, by the way, who were moving to Austin, <laughs> uh, you know, they, they, they can see this. And again, I can't get behind these calculations, but I will, what I wanted to point out is that there are a lot of variations. There is a lot of gaming. With your kilowatt hours and therms, your scope one and scope two, there might not be as much, but there is a lot. And I'm not saying Austin isn't hitting 8.9, I mean uh, 8.5, just like I'm not saying that California is really at 9.1. I'm going to show you some numbers in a bit. But uh, that, that's for you to know, I'm, I'm trying to calibrate all of us. So you, when you see these things, you aren't afraid. And when someone says, oh, well, we're only 9 metric tons or we're 80 metric tons, it's still kilowatt hours and therms and gallons of gasoline, gallons of uh, diesel. So you might say, well, how do I even begin? So scope two is electricity. So what I want to show you is that there's something uh, called a power profiler and it tells you how clean your electricity is. So just like I showed you that graph of uh, states right here, we have our, the electricity coming out of us right now is uh, you know, either cleaner or dirtier. And I'm showing where that comes from. It's very simple. You can actually get on the EPA Power Profiler, and you type in the zip code. I typed in Fort Worth. And what happens is there is a grid sector, which I think we all know after, that, uh, after the problems you had a couple of years ago when you had that freeze. Um, Texas has its own grid sector. So you can see what, they d what Texas is doing. Um, there's about 813 pounds of greenhouse gas given off for every megawatt hour of, uh, of uh, power that's generated. So that's kind of the number. It's 813 pounds per megawatt hour. That's 0.8 pounds per kilowatt hour. Now, where does that come from? You can see gas, when you look at the generation profile in the Texas grid, gas is about close to 50%. You guys and gals are still using about 17, or close to 20% coal. You guys have nuclear, a lot of 10% uh, nuke. Uh, your solar is only 3.5%, and I think you know that. Your wind is like 21%. It's, you, it's really significant. So I just want to mention that is, there's a lot of math behind these, but you know, there's a lot of algorithms behind your cell phone. You don't really look at this. You just know where it comes from. Do you know your zip code? <laughs> Type it in. Boom. You change kilowatt hours uh, to pounds of carbon. Boom. So I guess, uh, by the way, speaking of, since we're in Texas here, speaking of uh, uh, clean energy. So I didn't even know this, but there's one state that has much more renewable energy than uh, anybody else in the country, and that's Texas. Now again, there's a little gaming there, if I may, just because I'm from California, so I have to protect myself a little. Uh, they, uh, te Texas, uh, this is utility grade solar, utility grade wind. I'm not sure. My brother Phil is here. He's in Dallas. He just put a solar system up and he keeps going to me. Wow. I didn't know these work so well. I'm amazed. And I am. I have a solar system and a battery system in my house and at the office. And it's just amazing. It's a commodity now. It's not different than buying a cup of coffee. I'm telling you. And it works. It just works. It's, it's really, truly amazing. So anyway, but Texas is de definitely uh, generating a lot more um, way double, double, triple the wind power of any other state right now. I want to take that same grid just to kind of show you and keep you calibrated here. And I want to show you, I typed in my zip code, right? In San Jose, California. I'm going to show you the fuel mix in California. <clears throat> so you have solar at 3.5. We have solar at 19%. Uh, let's see, what else? Oh, you've got gas at 47. We've got gas at 47. Pretty interesting, huh? Uh, I have all these, uh, you know, in California, 
until recently, we were pretty snooty about how green we were, but I always tell my, the people I work with, and I have a lot of snooty, green, wishing friends, and uh, notice our coal. I always say, you guys, you, you act like we're so green. We're almost 4% coal. Do you know the power we're bringing in right now is 4% coal? No, that's impossible. Yeah, it is. It's what we do. So again, is there gaming or is there different philosophies? Is people saying different things? Yeah, but the numbers are right there, and it's pretty clear. <clears throat> so. Uh, I did want to show you, your nuclear is 9.5%, ours is 8.1%. If we have a little extra time, I'll show you what's going on in nuclear power. It's quite interesting right now. Uh, but uh, we were about to shut up. We have one nuclear power plant left in California, and it was, it was legislated to shut down in two years, and they just extended it for uh, 10 years. So. Uh, that's because nuclear power doesn't give off any greenhouse gas. And I know a lot of you probably know a lot of people who just say, nuclear power, that's the worst thing in the world. Well, even California just extended it because they finally looked at the numbers and they said, wait, what? So, uh, and you'll see, I think you're going to see more of that. I think you, some of you may be commissioning nuclear power plants in, in soon, we'll see. But uh, it's, it's that strong. And again, if I have time, Tim, I'm not sure what our time is like, but if I have time, I, I have a great slide on, on the uh, carbon footprint of a nuclear power plant. Okay. So um, speaking of that, there's this old saying, did you know that there's a larger chance of you dying from riding your bicycle to a nuclear protest than there is from dying from a nuclear reactor? Just <laughs> Anyway, so again, I just have a slide here. Texas generates 113,000 gigawatt hours of, of wind energy per year. And uh, you can see California leads in solar. And this is utility grade. We, I think we have a gazillion more rooftops, but uh, you can see the different, kind of the differences there. Okay, so what I want to start showing you now is because you've got to do paybacks, right? You've all, we've all been driven by payback, payback, payback. What's the payback? Is it less than three years? I can't, oh, I can't do it if it's not less than three years. So uh, I just want to show you the value of carbon, and that's the great irony right now. That provost at Stanford was like, wow! I want to show you the value of carbon right now. And I just, uh, this is a recent graph. Uh, so the uh, United Kingdom is valuing at about $100 per metric ton. US, we're barely valuing at about 15 per metric ton. I'll show you where that comes from. But here, let me tell you the point. So the point of this is that you now know that it's pretty, it's, it's like a two-step calculation to go from kilowatt hours to metric tons. The point eight one three. So what I want to show you is what the equivalent value of a metric ton, a metric ton, that sounds like a lot. 50,000 kilowatt hours, yeah, I don't really understand, but metric ton, wow. So uh, that comes out to about 0 0.003 per kilowatt hour, three mils per kilowatt hour. Now, I didn't say to the provost, well, we're only saving three mils per kilowatt hour. The other project is saving, we're at 21, 25 in California. I don't know what you are, but uh, the provost is back there, metric tons, wow. But this is what's going on. This is the real numbers. Uh, even the United Kingdom, where they're, uh, where they're valuing at 100 pounds, uh, $100 per metric ton, you're running about uh, two cents a kilowatt hour. So proportionally to the project, the impact of what you are doing with those CX projects with scope one and scope two is staggering. But what they want to hear is, oh, well, what are we doing with scope one and scope two on this project? Probably nothing, right? I don't know. So that's what we're going to get to. I just want to show you, in uh, California is, I think, the only state in the country that has a cap and trade program. I could spend a half hour telling you about cap and trade, but it does give us a daily price for carbon. And we had this huge surge uh, in 2021, 2020. So carbon went up to $35 a metric ton. Oops. Uh, $35 a metric ton. That was seven mils a kilowatt hour. But there was this big surge and it made the paper and all that, a big surge in price of carbon. So uh, again, you get a sense of things. And I I'm showing you this because my whole point today is not only are you already doing the right thing that you know you're doing, but the impact is much greater than so many other solar projects, green projects that are going on. Okay, so I do want to talk a little bit about offsets because we're going to kind of verge into scope three a little bit. And I do want to tell you, so uh, in, you know, I live in San Jose, California, and the, 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 uh, 
business section every month or so frames some CEO of one of the companies, PayPal CEO, and to get them to be personally involved, what are the five things you don't know about this guy? He hates email, his first job was an auto mechanic. That's probably a lot of us, so that's an interesting thing. But what I liked is number four here, everything in his house, including all his electric bill and his Range Rover is carbon neutral. Whoa, this guy is green, isn't he? He's really green. Well, what happens is there are offsets available. And again, during Q&A, I can go into it a little bit. But uh, basically, so I got on the, you can get on pretty quick, go to uh, Carbon Fund or Terra Pass is what I used. And so what do you think, this guy, what do you think he makes? 10 million a year? 20 million a year? So he has carbon neutralized his Range Rover for $54.42 a year. The bragging rights. He didn't say, I commissioned my HVAC system at home. He said, I've got a carbon neutral Range Rover. And it cost him $54.42. And so again, that's some, we're going to go into the scope three a little bit, but that's something that's a huge thing that people are doing. And that, in a way, is part of the gaming. Uh, Salas O'Brien, Tim, Tim and I have been working, I've been working there a long time. Tim's been there about, how many years, Tim? Ninety six. Okay, so uh, I talked to our CEO the other day. You know, we could buy carbon credits, and we'd say that we're carbon neutral right now. And he said it's just a gimmick, Carl. So uh, he did. He wouldn't spring fifty four dollars. Come on, Darren, give it up. But anyway, uh, he he. Uh, it's, it's the point. The point is that uh, there is. Is it gaming or not? I'm not sure. I do know that that $54 goes into planting trees. There's a lot of methane recovery. These guys are legit. They get audited every year. Maybe some of you will be auditing Carbon Fund or TerraPass. And speaking of TerraPass, you may not know this, and in spite of my wife and I already reducing our carbon footprint at home by 55%, I flew here green. I, when I'm coming, I got a Terra Pass, I got on the web before I flew here, figured out miles to Dallas, air miles to Dallas, and I, I'm green. Now, so I'm green, I had this certificate. <clears throat> I walked on the plane, and nobody said anything. <laughs> I mean, I, heck with the certificate, we should have green halos, right? You do that, and I put a green halo, I walk on the plane. I'm the, I'm the one green guy here, I'm the one carbon guy here. But I do want to tell you, it cost me $70.82 to do that. And uh, again, for what I mean, it's like 500 bucks round trip, so, you know, 2%. But I get to say, I'm green. Now, I don't think many of you are impressed with that, but <laughs> I flew carbon free, just, just for the record. So that's why I do want to walk into scope three right now, because there are a couple of things going on with scope three that are important to understand. And of course, you can start looking at it. The first thing is employee business travel. Oh, it's all six compounds, by the way, scope three. So there's lots of places to work, and I'm guessing that some of you actually may overlap some of this. But what I wanted to show you is that, uh, you know, there's employee business travel. So you know, I flew carbon free. Oh, well. But what I want to show you, and what's in Tim's con case study, which I'm gonna sh we're going to talk about at the end, is product use. This all the products you use, there's a carbon footprint associated with each one. Just like the MSDS, the uh, material data safety sheets, there, we know what the carbon footprint of almost every, any product you're using is. And we're all changing out chillers and all the new refrigerants. Uh, in fact, 134A is being phased out after this year. You have to have a global warming potential of 700 or less. I think 134A is like up in the 1200s. So we're moving towards 513A, 514, uh, and uh, now um, refrigerant 32. But when Tim changed out that chiller, he's got the new refrigerants, and that's scope three. And so we're going to be getting down to that in a second. I, I, I don't want to go over the other things, but there is, you know, on these uh, emissions baselines, you can look at almost anything and say we've reduced that much, including we buy, we pay $17 every time we send somebody someplace, and we're, so we've reduced scope three by X amount of tons. So that's, um, <clears throat> They had asked us to talk about the Carbon Reduction Act, and I do want to show you in the news, kind of like the uh, value, the irony of the value of carbon, um, the irony of the Inflation Reduction Act is that there's about $370 billion in the Inflation Reduction Act. This is kind of a funky, weird, interesting graph. Basically, what this is saying, for instance, is they've got $370 billion. Um, there's, uh, there's putting about 
40 billion, 42 billion into buildings. But again, I have to tell you, much to my, not surprise, most of this electrification, decarbonization. It's not really, there's no direct return on most of this. Most of these are credits. Uh, most is going into electrification. There's a lot of nuclear. There's a lot of uh, just electrification projects. You're going to be seeing a lot of central plants going in. They're going to be doing, getting rid of the boilers and putting in uh, uh, heat, heat pumps. So I wish I could tell you that there's direct money coming to you from this. There isn't. But what I am going to leave you with is a couple of really important things. And uh, one is, no surprise, this is, oopsie, this, uh, what, last week, I think you heard this. You know, the, 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 the Democrats did pass this cap. Uh, they're they're going to allow us to re uh, increase the cap on our spending in this country. But in the Republican bill that passed the contract, they're going to repeal most of the provisions in the Inflation Reduction Act relating to climate change. And where that goes, we're not sure. But I wanted to show you that, and I want to leave you with the most important slide next to Tim's final case study. And that is uh, why CX is so, such, why you can sell your CX projects so much stronger with a slight change at the end. By the way, it saves 4,000 metric tons. So, City of Sacramento, they had a big sustainable, creating a sustainability city. You've probably seen this a lot, everybody, your uh, commercial, your industrial, institutional people, and all your institutions are putting these sustainable, sustainable campus, sustainable, raise, reduce our cut, carbon footprint, so there's a $100,000 study to do this. So then, wow, that's a great plan, let's implement it. So then the next year, there's a $100,000 study out, how do you implement the uh, City of Sacramento sustainability plan? So I'm going through it, wow. Look what it says on page seven. Look what it says on page seven. <laughs> we ain't got no money. We ain't got no money, so let's take existing resources. Who is their existing resources? The guys and the gals in the field doing commissioning. The guys and the gals in the field doing energy projects. And by the way, all those baselines are scope one and scope two. Your electric bill, your gas bill, your backup generator diesel bill. So we're going to end with the same case study. Tim, you want to talk about it? Yeah, we'll finish this. Let's take a case study, but let's add climate and decarbonization metrics. Yeah, one thing that we did on, interesting on this um, to establish what those savings were initially you know, we did a detailed energy model, did a train trace program, went through the entire thing, and we, we had to establish the baseline. You know, whenever you do payback analysis, if you want to do a computer analysis, you got to do a baseline. So we did a baseline before we ever did anything. Uh, after phase one, uh, all that work had been done, we went through about 14 months after that was completed, gathered all the utility bills, we had the gas, we had the water, we had the uh, power bills straight from the lab, uh, Georgia Power. This is their and the Atlanta Gas, and then the city of, Atlanta, uh, city of Atlanta water system. So we went through and analyzed that, and what we did, we essentially calibrated the energy model. So we took that baseline energy model, all our changes, we did our estimate to get our estimated savings. Now we had that energy model. Now we had real data. So we took each month, gathered all that energy information, plugged that in and quote, calibrated an energy model. And the, the great thing was we were with, within single digits of our energy model and the savings. It was pretty amazing. And those uh, same models now, as you know, there's a little teeny algorithm that, that calculates the scope one, scope two savings. Exactly. So, you know, you go back to phase one, uh, 1.4 million pounds of greenhouse gases. So when you relate this to, uh, you know, that's a substantial amount because we had, you know, 68,000 therms, a lot of KW. Scope two, um, we, in this first phase, we saved 657,000 pounds of greenhouse gases. Scope three was zero. Yeah. You know, and Carl defined what scope three was. So, you know, 
One and two is what are, most people are really talking about. You, you rarely hear the, in, the information about scope three, but one and two are the, the easy savings. So, and Carl mentioned the thing about refrigerant changes and things like that. So when we, we swapped out the chiller, again, like I said, at R22, we put in R34A, R34A went in. Um, and, you know, obviously, you know, scope one and two, uh, really scope one was nothing. But scope two and three, look at the impact. Changing the refrigerant, scope three, 500,000 pounds. I mean, it's huge. And scope two was a million. So when you, to circle the wagons, you know, we had a great energy project, saved a lot of money, buildings operate much better. But when you throw in the climate change, look at the impact. And this is what we're trying to drive home every job you do. You analyze your savings, but a lot of these corporate bigwigs, they just care about the money. You're going to save how much carbon? Sign me up. It's like that smaller one uh, project. They all over that. And then you, it makes it easy sell for us to say, hey, let's talk about your carbon footprint. Hey, you know, all these corporations we all work with, a lot of, a lot of big companies around the country, everybody's into this. I mean, it's any, any decent sized company in, in our country, they have policies and it's easy to research how it is. So there's a huge opportunity in that, like you said, uh, somebody said yesterday, you, in the first five minutes, you're gonna sell your client or you're gonna lose them. So you wanna, your concern needs to be, how can I help you save your carbon footprint? And again, what I would like to add is that I've seen so many of us, myself included, walk into a meeting and say, uh, yeah, well, it's only a five-year payback, but you really should do it, as opposed to, you know, it's a five-year payback, but it also reduces your carbon footprint by 4,000 metric tons. And it's a big difference. It's a big difference in a meeting. Not to your facility guys, because they're going to go, who cares? But it leak up just a little bit, and somebody's going to say, what? That commissioning project is also saving 4,000 metric tons toward our uh, commitment for 2035? We're in. We're in. Yeah, so That's our pitch. Makes it, <laughs> it makes it an easy sell when you can throw the climate change right into it. And, uh, it it's, and you get to those higher level, those decision makers on hiring you to do your job. That's the people that believe in this stuff. They want to reduce that carbon footprint. And it's, when, you, when you say, I'm an expert in carbon footprint reduction, you don't need to tell them all how the trait is. You just tell them you know how to do it. And it's stuff we do every day. We already do it. We just don't talk about it. And we don't make that a big emphasis. Our big emphasis is oh, we can save you a lot of energy, a lot of money. Operating costs will go down. Hey, by the way, you know, your metric tons of carbon will save you is this much. And these decision makers are just like Carl said, what? Sign me up. We're, you know, they, they don't care about the money. They care about that thought process. Hey, our company is committed to this. We're going to do it. That's part of the process. And that's the way you sell your work. And, and, and when, when I go to my uh, galas, my fundraisers, I, I never say we save kilowatt hours in therms. I say, well, you know, my company does a lot of clean energy work. We're working on a reducing company's carbon footprint. We do a lot of work in the scope one and scope two area. Wow, that guy must know what he's talking about, man. <laughs> so I'm just telling you, that's what happens at my parties now. So, <laughs> right, so we've got about 10 minutes left. Is there any, any questions, comments? Hey, how, how is the conversation changing with decarbonization and carbon footprint, knowing that this new ASHRAE 241 standard is coming out related to indoor air quality as well? How are you approaching that? That's the ultimate irony. That's the, I've, we've been having that struggle since we phased out uh, R11 and R12 back in the 80s. Uh, they, all the chillers got less efficient. It, it's the great ambiguity. That's all I can tell you. And the only people who understand it are us. They don't, other people don't understand that. But uh, again, in my mind, to answer your question, it makes what you're doing more valuable. Because with the new refrigerants, and I just looked at a curve yesterday of, uh, we had R134A, we inspect it, but they can't deliver, you know, it's a year of lead time now, and it's phasing out next year, they can't deliver it for a year, so we have to move to R513A. It's about a 3% degradation in efficiency all the way across, and, uh, oh well. 
that's, that's, I wish I could tell you something different, yes. but it's not. But it makes you more valuable, so that's good. You know, it's, it's a great program to, to move people towards carbon reduction. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the disingenuous behavior in terms of baseline? Like PepsiCo will say they're reducing, and, and you look at the fine print, and it's, oh, they, they, picked, they cherry picked the year, they cherry picked the baseline numbers, and they cherry picked the, cherry picked the scope. Is that something you that's what, well, I don't think you're going to. I, there, you saw the variables, that's the, tr and that's the trouble, that's the opportunity. We all want to do our best, but every, all the companies are profit making, all the institutions don't have enough money, so they, there are people, consultants hired, that can cherry pick or look at the thing, the low hanging fruit. What's the difference between cherry picking and low hanging fruit? I'm not sure, but I agree with you. That's why I put the word gaming here, because it is pretty interesting. And if I lived in Austin, I would love to know how they got 8.5 metric tons per person. I'm curious. I don't, dis I don't uh, discount it, but I'm curious. Yes, sir. So uh, this is really interesting in making it, you know, commissioning uh, relevant to decarbonization. Um, it seems like we're at the precipice of moving to more hourly uh, greenhouse gas emissions measurement on, on scope one, scope two, um, and like big companies who have carbon neutral, they want to see that not just at a net level, they want to see it at an ongoing basis if they're never uh, exceeding some amount of carbon generation. Like commissioning seems to have an even larger role to play when you start looking at time of use and that sort of thing. And, and how this is, are you all seeing that in your customers? Well, actually, you know, I, the reason I still like doing this stuff is because I learn every time. I hadn't even thought of that. But, you know, we've been talking a lot about monitoring-based commissioning the last couple of days, and that's kind of real-time commissioning. So you, you're looking at how many kilowatt hours this year versus last year. On this day, you can multiply by 0.813, and you've got the, how much you reduced your carbon footprint or increased it that day. So I hadn't thought about that, but that's actually another selling point in my well, mind. And that's one of the things about, you, you see a lot of, lot of vendors talk about monitoring-based commissioning, and you think about it, look at all the existing buildings we have, and there's just a gigantic market in the existing building. A lot of buildings have never been commissioned, but the recommissioning, or even go back and, and retro commission, but the monitoring base hits that on the head because you'll go through and do your retro commissioning, come up with all your savings, but then you need to implement that monitoring based commission. So you're you're doing, looking at fault detection, you're looking at taking a real analysis of what their power, how much they and they can track that. And and ideally you would want to do a monthly energy report for your client. And you, you're seeing a lot of vendors now, there were several at, uh, at the uh, exhibit hall. Um, there's some really good systems out there. Uh, you have to look at the cost too. There's a cost associated with that. But so. Tim, I just had an idea. I mean, I really hadn't thought about it. When you're selling monitoring, you was all those things you talked about, but you can also, do you know that this will also show you your greenhouse gas? Yeah. I mean, I, that's, and that's a, exactly that's a great what idea. About that's great idea. <laughs> so you're gonna save this money, but I never here's, your, that. here's your carbon reduction on a monthly basis. Yeah. And that's very easy once you have this software and it's you have it installed, very easy to add that to your, here's your energy report, here's your carbon reduction report. Put that together, clients should. I, I really believe there's a huge market for all of us yeah. in monitoring based commissioning. It's gigantic. That 800 pounds, mm -hmm. like that number is not constant, and that's not the same at 10 a.m. as it is at 4 p.m. So that's a very rough aggregation of mm -hmm. the operation over a period of time. And like folks like Google are saying, we want to be net zero at every Exactly. To, you may want to shift load and you're not necessarily doing it just to avoid the peak price, you're doing it to avoid carbon generation. And it, the cost fees are high, that's also when you're, you're, you know, can be when you're carbon. And the, and the more corporations that start talking about that, the, the, again, I think there's the more opportunities. Somebody over here. Yeah. I want to talk to you more about that. There's a lot of, we could talk about an hour of that, if you buy me a beer. Five minutes. <laughs> All right. So as we're starting to move away from like DUI for our building metrics to uh, greenhouse gas production, are you starting to push um, more electrification in some of our major building components? We're, 
I think, I would suggest that our customers are pushing us towards electrification. It's really hard for me. Uh, we're working at one of the, San Jose State University, they have a six megawatt cogeneration machine, scope two. It's generating power right now about five cents a kilowatt hour. It's a beautiful cogen. You know, we all know CHP, how well, a PG&E, our utility provider, is providing power at 22 cents a kilowatt hour. But they have to reduce their carbon footprint, fossil fuel free, decarbonized by 2030. So that we, we give them the numbers, the numbers are, gonna, the bill's gonna go up by $5 million a year if you wanna decarbonize. So uh, our customers are pushing us, but we're also showing them the reality. Do they wanna see it? Not necessarily, but. But that's, that's easy for somebody to go into bigger facilities, but you know, I, I do a lot of escrow work, I'm doing a lot of work with small school districts and whatnot. And when you're telling me you want to replace the boilers with, with um, it started having hot water heat pumps or something. Yep. You know, you can see a water factor that's starting to occur, but I don't see that there's a whole lot of uh, education going to these smaller facilities. There but isn't. I'm kind of reminded that, hey, we can get you cheaper after you have boiler now. Yeah. No, it's true. I was in the city of San Jose, city of Berkeley just passed, you know, we, you can't put gas lines into homes or schools or commercial buildings anymore. You can't put... Yeah, I, again, I, I work at the city council level sometimes to say, you guys, you're nuts. You're nuts. But, you know, you can only do that. And that's why I, I think we're the kind of people who can educate them. But again, we follow our customers, gang. You know, when they want to go out electrification, we are honest. We tell them the numbers. But... Uh, we, we're, we're on, we're, we follow our customers. Ultimately, some of them, that driver, and I don't, I told you something strange going on. That driver is so hard about electrification. And again, my brother and I were just talking about uh, heat pumps, domestic water heat pumps. This, the, the K through 12s we work with, half the maintenance guys can't even keep their boiler, their hot water heater working. You know, put a compressor in, your, in all your schools. But anyway, so. I feel your pain. We yeah, feel your pain. Yeah, we are seeing, talking about the, the heat, heat pump technology, uh, we've got a new project, it's a new nine story, and it's a lab built, uh, and it's a shell and core project, and the engineer is designing heat pumps for their chillers, yep. and they're generating, the, they're generating off the heat pumps domestic hot water and the hot water for your VAV boxes. So it's all electric, there's no gas in the building. So, and those heat, and there's three large, really large heat pump units. And the manufacturers are building larger. And, and more efficient, and more efficient. So, uh, and then of course you've got variable speed compressors. Uh, it, the, the efficiency is going up. But again, there's a cost associated with it. But if you're looking at the carbon reduction, when you go full electric like that, you're eliminating all the, all the gas, it's yeah. gone. So you're, 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 that's what some of these corporate clients, they don't really care about that extra cost because they're thinking about that corporate goal to reduce the carbon, and that's what's happening. Yeah. Yes? All the uh, software providers over here, they're using the same technology, they're using the same No, I, I, like I said, I, I think the, the you know these. If you can get a client, I, I think if once you get one client and do these monthly reports on energy and carbon reduction, yeah, you know, I think you got a client for life. Especially these big corporations. Once you can get one, it's easy to sell the next one and the next one and the next one. And I really think in our business, I see a gigantic opportunity for all of us in this room for doing exactly that. No question about it in my mind. It's a huge, huge chance for us. One more minute. It's, Anything yeah, else? We, got, we should probably end. Any more? Thank you very much, gang. Thanks hey, go get, go get them. Go get them. Go get them.